Hey there, welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel, and today we're going to build an adventure. So I've been kind of, this is a bit of a series going on now, building some adventures using the basic book of the BX set, uh, which is going to be basically dungeon crawl adventures. You know, remember levels one through three are basically, you know, around dungeon crawls. Uh, when we get to the expert book, which we'll eventually do, I guess, they'll, we'll do talk about some wilderness adventures. Um, but I, I wanted to go through this, this against a series, so this is, I think, the third one. Uh, I'm going to kind of gloss over a little bit of it because I talk about it mostly in the first of the series, which I'll put a link to. But so I've done a little bit of like legwork here to make the video a little shorter. Um, but otherwise, we're going to get right into it. If you have questions about different parts of this, let me know. Somebody had a question about uh, the treasure types and how that works. So we're going to spend a little bit longer on that in this video um, when we get to it. But first, let's talk about the basics, as you will. So this is the uh, multi basic book. That's right. This is this guy right here. Right. Um, OSC, you know, would be the same rule set, although this type of stuff is not exactly written the same, you know, but you're getting the same information. So on page B51, we've got this setup of creating adventures. Obviously, you can pick, but there's a D10 of uh, adventure scenarios, if you will, uh, right over here. So I rolled a uh, D10 and I got a 10 this time. So 10 comes out as finding a lost race. Let me see if I can blow that up so we can see it. Okay. The, okay. So finding lost race is defined as the players find a once human race, which has lived underground for so long that it has begun to change. Its members might have developed infravision, changed color, or begun to fall back into animal ways. The scenario works well uh, when used for with destroying an ancient evil, which we'll look at in a second, since lost races are often servants of ancient powers. Now, of course, this is based on sword and sorcery, right? We read a lot of sword and sorcery adventures when you know the the heroes kind of discover these strange lost races they've often often fallen under the influence of these strange evil powers and that's kind of why they've devolved or, or whatever however you want to say it um scenario requires extra work and imagination by the dm since details for the lost race must be invented this is true if you want to make a full campaign out of it i'm going to keep it real simple um for this purpose but we're going to open this up to possibly maybe our second mega dungeon because this is going to be a the beginning so under destroying an ancient evil which we're not going to add here because I want to do each one separately. <laughs> um, the evil is usually a monster or NPC. I mean, there will be something like that in here, but we'll deal with it. The exact type not known by the players. Sometimes the evil has uh, been deeply buried and reawakened by recent digging. Uh, so maybe we are using this a little bit. Uh, this theme is often used along with others. For example, ancient evil may be, may be destroyed before some ruins are resettled. Okay, so, you know, again, these a lot of these uh, suggestions actually do tie together and can be used, you know, not just like making a single thing, but we're going to try to, you know, do one of each, I think. So, in any case, uh, at first I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? Create some kind of lost city, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, then I was like, oh, I got to roll. So I rolled on um, this list here and I got abandoned mine. So now tying that together with what we just read over here about the destroying the evil, right? Something's been... Uh, done by digging, right? So now we've got this mine that's been abandoned and some ancient race. So how does that work for us? So a couple of things going on here. Because I know that I want this to be a kind of a supplementary adventure to go with my kind of Mega Dungeon campaign, I'm making it level two-ish. Uh, that's my plan. Um, so I'm going to, maybe the next one I'll do level three because I've made a couple level twos now. And with this level two adventure, we're going to make it, a, you know, appropriate to that. I am also going to use what we talked about before we made the orc layer. I'm going to use a layer. So I'm going to find a single type of monster and I'm going to basically put a full layer worth of those monsters in there. In this case, the monster is going to be the ancient race. Um, okay, so let's take a quick look. We're on my, people always ask me how I do this technically. So this is my, just my iPad basically. I don't really do like a screen capture, but this is actually my iPad. That's where I started writing it. So this is just a notes, the notes uh, app, if you will, on my iPad. So you see, I've written a few things here. Basically, we've got an abandoned mine, right? Providing a lost race, abandoned mine, level two. These are things that I know I want to do. Um, so I made some notes to myself. Perhaps the mine opened up uh, into the realm of a lost race and the mines, the miners uh, began to disappear or be found dead, killed in strange and hideous ways, which caused the mine to be shut down. So now th that's why it's an abandoned mine, right? And then I got a couple of different hooks, depending on how I want to introduce it to my party or you know whoever's going to run this adventure. And the first one is... Uh, it's a good location for a treasure map to point to. Um, by the time this airs, I'm not exactly sure, um, but KR King, I'll put a link, has been doing uh, actually a, a series on treasure maps. So he might still be in the middle of this, but um, or it might be over, but either way, I'll put a link. You guys can look at his treasure map videos. They're pretty cool. 
uh, the ones he's done so far. In any case, um, that's a good location for a treasure map to point to. Either the mine itself, uh, said to have gems, uh, or, you know, maybe it's a gem mine, right? Oh, you get here and you get a bunch of gems. Or the treasure was buried by by some long-dead adventuring party, right? So maybe they hid it in the mine, and then they never went back for it. The other option, which is a little more quest um, uh, it has been unused for a couple of generations, and the new owner wants to open it. They have sent two groups of miners ahead to scout, but received word from the second that the first was not there. Fearful something dangerous lurks, the PCs are sent to clear uh, the mine of any animals or creatures that may have taken residence in the years the shut, uh, since the shutdown. They're offered a reward of some sort. So again, this is a classic question giver thing, right? Go to this mine. You know, they're thinking, right, well, the mine's been shut down for 50 years. Maybe there's orcs that have moved in or maybe, a, a you know, whatever, or some kind of monsters. So the pieces are going to go ready to fight something. Of course, this ancient race is going to be something completely different. Now, so I had to pick a monster. And for me, for sword and sorcery, for ancient races, nothing beats snake men. But of course, there's no snake men in BX. So what do we do? I looked at lizard men, which are pretty cool. But then I also thought I may use lizard men again. <laughs> and I was kind of flipping through and thinking what would be kind of the most equivalent. And what I came up with was troglodytes. Let's look at troglodytes for a second. So again, we're back in the BX book. Let me triple over the monsters. Let's make this smaller. Uh, okay. The white apes would be interesting too, but they don't work out as... You could also do like a modified white ape. That, no, I'm just thinking about that. That would actually be pretty good. Did I pass troglodytes? what I was talking Um. No. I always find them by looking for their picture. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so the picture of the troglodyte here shows them as kind of almost like a lizard facey kind of guy. I'm going to treat them a little more humanoid because if we actually read the, the description of troglodyte, uh, a troglodyte is an intelligent human-like reptile with a short tail, long legs and spiny comb and hidden arms. Troglodytes walk upright and use their hands as well as humans. Uh, they hate most other creatures and will kill them kill anyone they meet. Well, that sounds very nice. Um, they have a chameleon-like ability to change colors and use it to hide by rock walls, surprising on a roll of one through four. So that's pretty big. They secrete an oil which produces a stench that will nauseate humans and demi-humans unless the victim saves versus poison. Nauseated characters will have a penalty of minus two on the two hit rolls while in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the troglodytes. That's all great. And I thought at first, I was like, well, I'll just use troglodytes and we'll say, well, troglodytes might not exist in this world. But since th I'm making a generic adventure that anybody can run, then I'm now making an assumption that your world doesn't have troglodytes. So let's modify them a little bit. So what I decided to do was make them um, troglodytes exactly the way they are, change them up to be a little bit more human-like, maybe with more kind of, you know, snake scale. So we'll, the way we'll describe them will be a little more snake man-ish. Keep the chameleon ability, because I love that. Um, lose the stench, right? Because that's very signature troglodyte, but instead, because they're snake men, we'll add a poison bite. So we've got, um, they already have attacks, two claws, one bite. So if they hit with the bite, then it works like the stench. There's a saving throw made, and if they fail, then they're going to be minus two on their attacks. Of course, it'll be anything, because not just melee, because obviously they're poisoned. And it'll last a certain amount of turns or whatever. So that way, we're kind of using a monster that already exists. You've probably seen me do this before. I talked about this with Ritual Magic. I like to take stuff that already exists in the game and convert it a little bit versus starting whole cloth, which leads to my second monster. So whenever they're snake men, they've got to be worshipping a giant snake, right? That's such a classic trope. We've got to have a giant snake. So I looked at the giant snakes and I don't know. I mean, they're good. You know, they're, 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 they're pretty powerful, but none of them, forgetting about, now again, I'm not caring. I mean, I do care, obviously. Uh, my initial thought wasn't worrying about what the snakes did physically with their abilities, because that's easy enough to change. But just looking at the descri descriptions of them, we've got a spinning cobra is three feet long. Pit viper is five feet long. Sea snakes, obviously, I'm not going to use because we're not using a sea, although I can put a six foot long, though, anyways. Um, although the six foot long for every three hit dice, so that could be interesting. Um, giant rattlesnake snake is 10 foot long, which is, again, is, I mean, that's a pretty darn big snake, but it's not a snake god, right? Black, uh, or a rock python, rather, um, seems to me to be the closest. It's 20 feet long, that's a big snake, but I feel like I want it to be even bigger. So I'm looking at the stats here at the, rock, at the python. My first thought was, let me go and just basically look at the at dragons, because dragons are basically worms and snakes and whatever. And, you know, any dragon is going to be way too tough. I'm not going to put a dragon against a second level adventure. But I looked at the white dragon, and the white dragon is three armor class and has six hit dice. So I decided, let's take a peek at what I got here. So I'm going to go to my iPad. What I've got for my snake, giant snake god, right down here, I moved to the top. Um, we're going to use the giant rock python stats, but we're going to change the arm class to three. We're going to change the hit dice to six. 
the original snake. The bite did one to four, and the squeeze does uh, two to eight. I just upped them because it's bigger. And I put the treasure shape next to it, although I don't think I'm going to use that because, again, this is going to be combined with the troglodytes in their lair. So I might throw a little extra treasure in with the snake, but it's going to be part of the troglodyte lair. So I'm not going to go too crazy. We'll see what we roll for treasure. Um, then, as always, I wanted to have like a basic idea of what, what this adventure was going to be. So I, I made some notes of possible other monsters. So I'm thinking it's an abandoned mine. They're going to come down to the mine. They're going to find this lost city. So what could be in the mine? Zombies, which might be from the dead miners. Yellow molds are great because it's just areas of yellow mold. And then uh, cave locusts, because I haven't used those ever, I don't think. Um, and the great thing about cave locusts, when I read them, was, well, first of all, they're really funny because they're basically, they don't, if you read the description, they don't generally attack people, but they're kind of stupid, essentially, or they have a bad sense of direction is the way they describe it. So if a cave locust, um, I'm finding it right now, if a cave locust tries to flee, which they most likely will, they're basically going to almost seem like they're attacking because there's a 50% chance that they're going to smack into, <laughs> um, you know, a, a, a person and basically attack them. Now, what's interesting about the cave locusts is they eat yellow mold. And I'm also thinking to myself, we've got this, this civilization down here. What are they eating? What's the, what's the ecology down here? So I thought, there's no reason why these creatures cannot eat cave locusts as their main, you know, consumable. Obviously, it's not people because they've been buried in here all this time, right? So they don't really know much about people. Maybe they've encountered the occasional miner and they probably would eat them. But generally speaking, their main diet is going to be the cave locust. The cave locust eats the yellow mold. The yellow mold just is there, right? And the snake people eat the cave locust. So we got like a little bit of an ecology going on here. Not that you have to do that, but you know, it can work out nicely when that happens. Uh, back to the iPad, we'll take a peek. So I decided because it's a mine that's been abandoned, there might be a, like some kind of a cave bear or something, or or a black bear. I thought just something small that might be living in the 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 entrance. I think this is more likely if you're going to do the treasure map scenario. If you're doing the mining scenario, I think the other miners would have run it off. So um, inside we might find centipedes because those are good crawly, creepy crawlies to have inside a, a, a cave or a dungeon. And the other thing that we might want to go with is green slimes because those are always good. They're good anywhere. So I made my list, so I kind of have an idea of what I want to do. And then I made a little bit of intro for me. I will often do this. If I'm doing a situation like this, I don't necessarily draw out the entire mine because I don't think it's that necessary. Basically, the mine is just the entrance. It's almost treated as one room to me. Um, so what I've got is a little bit of intro that will you can play out a little bit. It shouldn't take too long at the table, but it should set the pace. So I've got... Um, uh, mine should be fairly straightforward. Perhaps a bear set up in the den. I wish I said that, right? Uh, the shaft should be long and steep, dropping into the earth, requiring six turns before anything branches or changes. Why six turns? That's how long a torch burns. So you're going to be going through this. You know, you could be rolling your dice and or, or describing the environment. And now next thing you know, you can need a new torch. And now the party starts thinking, we're pretty deep into this. So do we have any supplies? What's going on? You know, and they start, this will actually add a little tension in the group, right? Um, right. And I say during this uh, period, the air gets thick with the smell of wet rock and earth and torches should flicker, right? Uh, check once for wandering monsters, and I put a little miniature wandering monster list here. Green slime, uh, centipede, or cave locust, all equally chance. Uh, then they will find a crumbled wall um, with a narrow passage with steep steps that are going to be obviously stairs that were carved that are ancient. So this is going to be interesting, hopefully, to a player character group. Uh, carved into stone, it'll wind down to three turns, so it's going to be long and narrow and compressed, right? Um, and then at this point, the, the air is so thin that like your torches are basically, or so wet or however you want to describe it, that your torches are only going to shed light about half as far as they normally would. This is now going to set the tone, right? So this whole first part of it, which might be like, I don't know, if you're running a three-hour adventure, this might be like 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how the characters role play, of getting through this part. But this is going to set the tone of the rest of it. So... We've done a bunch of different things with maps, and I like to do different. I like to do different things with maps. So this time I decided to just draw it with one piece of paper. So I drew it in my little notebook that has like dots, and then I just took a quick picture of it with my iPad. So we're going to see how this works out, and I'm just going to so that way I can show it to you guys. Uh, let's see if we can make this happen. Okay, so I'm using Procreate. Sorry for the shadow. Uh, I'm using Procreate, which I've used in the past. It's basically a um, a drawing program. Uh, I put a layer above the map, so the map is in the layer below, so we can draw on it. And I just want to kind of point out a few things here. So uh, let me switch to red. Okay. All right. So 
the way I see this working is that the lair of the giant snake is going to be back here, right? Number one. This is going to be a temple, right? The high priest of the snake man is going to be here. This is going to be a larder, basically, of the cave locust. And what I'm thinking is there's all of these paths leading off. And maybe these snake men have through smell or maybe they're breeding yellow mold or whatever. It's actually a good idea. Um, they're attracting in the cave locusts, right? And by doing that, then they get them in here and then they kill them and they eat them, right? So basically this, this room is going to be like a loaded possibly with cave locusts because they're going to be trapped there. Probably bodies of cave locusts is going to be yellow mold. It's going to be essentially, if the party goes in there, they, they probably should just leave. Like this probably, Maybe we'll put something tempting in there, but generally speaking, that is an area that you do not want to be in. But that might also be where if they get captured or they get the 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 snake men are smart, they'll try to push the party into that direction because maybe they're going to be immune to the poison of the of the yellow mold because you know they're venomous as they are. Okay, these areas here, these like cells, these are going to be exactly that. They're going to be the the spaces where the the snake people live. There's a lot of them in there. It actually works out perfectly because there's 40 troglodytes in a lair and there's, I think, 39 of these, if I counted it right. And then, of course, you got your high priest. So there could be one in each one of these or there could be some that are empty, however you want to do it. And again, I'm keeping this one really straightforward and linear because this is, this is meant to be played in a single session. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of kind of room-to-room -room combat in this one. That's how I see it. Uh, obviously, the party can do whatever they want. They could just collapse the whole uh, stairway and just leave them. Maybe that's what they'll do in the end. But if they want the treasure, they'll stay. So the stairway to get in is here, and this is going to be an ancient, uh, worn out, gone to 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 wreck, uh, you know, uh, hallway. Like maybe it was a great hall at one point, and essentially uh, there's going to be all kinds of art stuff that's been defaced and fallen apart, and maybe there's new art that's been like stuck on it and painted over things and stuff like that as the race evolves. This this can be where you really set your tone, okay? And of course, then you get into the larger area. Where they live essentially, and then you've got it. Then you get into the the temple as a, as a party progresses. And this is pretty wide; it's thirty feet wide. In, in this direction, collapse. This could be an opportunity for again, where I said this could be the next mega dungeon, right? Perhaps when this is these guys are taken care of and this is cleared away, maybe there's more levels below. In addition to that, I've done the same thing over here. I made a collapse that's impossible to get through, you know, very easily. Which means that again, this the party's not just going to go and go down there. They're going to have to dig it out. Which means they can't do that when the snake men are still alive. So they're going to have to clear the snake men out, snake men out to do it. And again, that could lead off to another adventure. And if they if they got past the um, the 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 cave locust somehow, and, and they wanted to, they could crawl through these tunnels. And maybe there's like caverns and tunnels to the cave locusts. I mean, that that could also be. So even though there's only really one way, and in a sense, this is really a funnel to get them down in there. There are, there are other options as they start adventuring here. So this is kind of like the, it is pretty linear in a sense, but at the same time, it could open up once they're down to this level. That's kind of how I see it. And in addition, if you're building a, a mega dungeon and you don't want to do the mine idea, you could literally just make this another level of the dungeon. I mean, that would be easy enough to do. So I think it'll be functional in that way. So let's, let's kind of go here. Let me clear that. And let's go back to our notes. All right, so we've got the main hall, which is the entrance. We we're going to then have the uh, temple of the lair of the snakes. Um, and we will have the larder. Um, and, oh, we've got the uh, high priest. There's always some kind of high priest chamber. Okay, so again, this is a pretty small dungeon, right? So, um, but before, before we get into this, uh, and if you're watching the video and you're not interested at all in treasure types and stuff like that, um, I'll put a like one of those bookmark things so you can jump ahead 
<laughs> so if you, if you want to go past this part, but I want to get into the treasure types because again, I've had some questions about this and some confusion. So we'll spend a couple minutes on, on the treasure, um, kind of my thoughts on it and also just how you use it in general. So we're going to go again back to the basic book. All right. So if we go over here to um, treasure, we can see that there are treasure types. And now essentially most of your monsters are going to be associated with the treasure type. You know, <laughs> I, I believe that in the al alphabetical order, the, the treasure types that are the lowest generally have the most treasure, but I don't think that's 100% accurate. And of course it's percentile wise, right? So it's kind of hard to, actually it's definitely not accurate as I'm looking at this. Because what we can do is we can look up here and we can see, well, you can't see it, but I'll highlight it. Yeah, we can see the average amount of treasure that you will get if you use a certain treasure type. Now, I have seen a blog post, it was a long time ago and I don't have it. So if anybody knows what I'm talking about, please put a comment below where they went through this and kind of revamped it because apparently it's not super accurate. At least some of them are off. And to my experience, that is definitely true of uh, B, which I've used quite a bit and I, I always get way more than 2,000. So, um, so 2,000 certainly can't be the average. Although I guess you could roll nothing. But in any case, what you're going to want to do when you're trying to decide what monsters are going to layer your adventure, like I'm using the troglodytes in this case, I'm going to want to look at this and say, what's the average treasure for the troglodytes treasure type? And their treasure type is actually A. <laughs> so according to this, the average treasure is 17,000 gold pieces. So that is a take, right? So this is actually a pretty um, a pretty rich dungeon if, if they get all the treasure that's in it, assuming that we roll it up. And what we're going to do is, so what I normally do is, like, let's say I picked a monster and I picked, I don't know, I picked a veteran, right, right here. A veterans is V. If I look at V, it doesn't even have a list here, but if I just look at V, I can see there's 10% of, and 5%, and 10%, so they see these very low amounts of just barely any treasure. You know, that would not be a very satisfactory uh but of course, there lives only 12 people. So again, you're not going to look at that as something. You might put several monsters in that la that layer, you know, or level of dungeon so you can equal out to enough treasure to what you want. In this case, though, this is more than enough. So what we're going to do, I mean, it's the, the way to do this is you just kind of go through, like I've got my, I'm going to type it over here and then we'll look at it in the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the, the treasure type and I'm going to say their treasure type is A. There's a 25% chance. So I got my percentiles dice. There's a 25% chance that there will be copper. So I rolled 55. That means there is no copper at all. Then there is a 30% chance that there is silver. Watch, I'm going to roll really low after you said that. 29. So I rolled a 29. So there is silver. So now I look. It says thousands of silver, one to six. So I'm going to roll a six-sider. And I got a three. That means that there is 3,000 silver pieces in this dungeon. And again, the way that I like to do things is almost certainly not going to all be in one place. Um, in this case, because there is a god, we might put a, a decent amount of the treasure with the god, but generally speaking, it's not going to all be in one place. And we'll deal with that in a second. Electrums. There's a 20% chance for Electrum. 60, none. There is a 35% chance of gold. 26. So there is gold. The gold here is two to 12,000 gold pieces. So I'm going to roll 2d6. Three and one, 4,000 gold pieces. So actually, this is going to be on the low end of the, the scale, I think, which is probably good because we're only second level adventure. Um, and again, you can scale this if you need to now. This, oh, 25% chance of platinum. I think this is one of the, not very few of them actually have a chance of platinum. So this is pretty nice if I get it. 24, 24, there is platinum. One to 2,000. So we're going to, I'm just going to roll a D6. If it's four through six, it's two. And if it's one through three, it's one. One. So it's 1,000 platinum pieces, which is equivalent to 5,000 gold pieces. So now we're actually, now we're at like 9,000 of 300 gold pieces, roughly. And then we've got gems and jewelry. Oh, this is where the real take could happen. So you roll for these separately. So we're going to, there's a 50% chance of gems. So let me roll. 25. So there are gems. And there's six, wow. There's six to 36 gems. So that's 66. Five. 10, oh my God, 16, now I'm rolling hide. 
Another six is uh, 22. Another six, oh my God, that's uh, 28. And two, 30. There are 30 gems in here. Wow. This actually works out really well. It's 30 gems. And then now this is where we could really be a lot. There's, uh, you know, again, a 50% chance of six to 36 jewelry. 46. 46, so there is. Wow, okay. So this is this is gonna be a lot of treasure. Five. Depending on, how, depending on what table you play, that could be an automatic crit or an automatic failure. <laughs> so five plus three is eight plus two is 10 plus three is 13 plus five is 18 plus three is 21. 21, wow, that's a lot of 21 jewelry. Okay. And there's a 30% chance of one to three magic items. Let me just go back and check this. Make sure that I'm just doing a treasure type here. Oh, it seems like a lot of treasure for trilodites, doesn't it? Did I pass them? Yeah, I did. Yeah, treasure type A. So yeah, trilodites got a lot of treasure, man. All right, 30% chance for magic. This is what this is what players care about. They care about money because they experience points, but magic for everybody loves. 47 no magic okay so if there had been magic here it would have been any three types so there'll be no magic in this dungeon so it's all treasure which is still pretty darn good now when we want to do the the monies here for this right we're going to scroll up to this chart right here with the gems um and it does say that you can roll them as bunches so since I have so many gems, there's 30 of them, I'm going to do it, I'm just going to roll three times. So there's going to be 10 of each of the three values. So I don't want to sit here and roll 30 times. I mean, if I had a dice roller or whatever, but since we're making a video, no, it. So the first roll I'm going to make is for the first 10 gems. 55. They're worth 100 gold pieces. So Second, 10 gems, 60, also 100, so that's 20 gems worth of those. Again, that's still um, that's still uh, you know uh, 2,000 gold pieces if they get all those gems. And finally, for the last 10, 92. Ooh, 92, 500. Okay, so five gems worth 500. Now, jewelry is where it's going to be a little ridiculous because <laughs> jewelry is worth 3d6 times 100 per piece of jewelry and you could definitely at this point you could just roll it and be like hell yeah um or we might just want to adjudicate that a little bit because this is going to end up being a lot a lot of treasure so we're either going to make it really difficult or what i think i'm going to do is i'm going to actually I'm going to roll it, right? And I'm going to I'm gonna make all the jewelry worth the same. Okay, so this is an awful lot of treasure, and it's probably way more than we really should be having in this adventure, but this is the way the dice roll, right? We could have rolled nothing. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to actually, instead of making all the jewelry the same value, because that's a little bit boring, um, I think what I'm going to do is use an automatic roller, because that just works better. So this is a Coyote dice roller. Um, let's see. And basically what you can do here is you can put in, I see here, I put number of rolls. I put in uh, 21. I got 36 times 100, and I'm just going to roll it. Boom. So we can see we got 700, 1,000, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 900. This is a lot of treasure. So that's pretty cool. And because there's so much of that, and there's so many of these uh, troglodyte snake men, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have each one of them have a piece of jewelry, right? And... This is going to be this is going to be ridiculously tempting for the player characters because they're going to encounter these guys you know let's say guards and kill a couple and be like whoa they have a really expensive piece of jewelry on them and then they're going to see that and it's going to make them want to continue to go in here and fight these guys so again this is going to become like a hack and slash dungeon and that's 100 percent fine not every dungeon has to be uh you know super think it out whatever some of the times it's just fun to go in there and take the treasure from the bad guys you know assuming that they they're bad we'll need to make sure they seem bad we have them you know if you do the missing miners then 
um, that scenario will definitely have the dead miners and you know easy enough if it's the treasure map then we'll have to maybe sh at least show some humans being killed or something to really for most parties but you know your table better than i do um and again if you just preface it with they know they're going in there to get treasure i think they're not gonna have a problem fighting for it but in any case without talking the uh about that kind of stuff let's just i'm gonna take a second and just kind of enter this all into um onto this sheet here so we see what we have and then we'll start hitting the map all right this might seem like a ridiculous amount of treasure and it really is we really rolled on the high end of the scale here so just you know i want to take a second to analyze it and think to myself do we want to do it this way or not and at first i was like well maybe i should add more challenge or possibly more monsters to balance it out but you know when you think about it if there's 40 of these um snake men and they are well organized it is going to be very difficult for a party to, party to take anything but a small amount of this treasure without you know having to run away essentially then come back possibly with more henchmen spend more money do those kind of things so I don't think it's really outrageous. In fact, I think most time, in most cases, they're going to probably get in here, um, unfortunately, get overconfident because there's so much treasure, and probably the party is going to take a lot of losses if, they, if they're not careful. If they go in there and they just handpick a handful, a few pieces, and they walk away, they might actually get a decent amount of experience points without too much danger. But if they keep pushing it, which they likely will, because adventurers are, you know, risk takers, then they're going to, if they somehow manage to make it out with a whole bunch of treasure good on them okay so i'm not gonna worry about it we're just gonna go for it you know again take what you roll if i at some point i'm sure i'm gonna roll one of these where the treasure is just gonna be garbage and well i did say before that you want to give people enough treasure to make it kind of worth their while and balance it out there will be times where they won't be and maybe what we'll do is if we roll up another one of these that's kind of not a lot of treasure we can um kind of combine them right to get them mixed up and again if you felt like this is way too much treasure for your group you can always reduce it but I would give it a shot. I always say this about these rules. Sometimes they seem a little out of whack, but in play, they generally work out really well. So with all those caveats aside, let's just do this. Okay, so again, this is a ridiculous amount of treasure down here with the, with the jewelry. Ridiculous. And what we can do is make it more difficult by stashing it away and making it and put it, make them work a little bit more for it insofar as like where we put it, right? Um, remember, I talked a little bit before about the idea that um, the they're using something to bring the cave locuses in, right? Maybe some of these gems and jewels are in that room with the with the with the yellow mold, which is a you know save or die. So it's a very dangerous without them being careful. So we can definitely spread that stuff out and put it in places where it's a little bit trickier. But before we do that, let's populate. We've got um, essentially living down here. We're going to have cave locuses. Oh, I should probably check to see how many. Let's check how many cave locuses are typical for a lair. Because again, these things aren't necessarily pushovers. None of them are. Um, even, even if cave locuses list treasure, I'm not going to add any more treasure to this because this is a ridiculous amount of treasure. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to start at the beginning. Locus cave. Cave locus, here we go. Now this is no treasure. Okay, so it's funny. Number of pairing is 2 to 20, but in layer 1 to 10. So I guess less because they're probably traveling, right? So we're going to have, um, you know, in that room, there could be 2 to 20 at any point. So let's jump over here to our iPad again. And let's go down to our larder with the locus. 2 to 20 at any one time. Yellow mold. Covers, statues. How many gems have we got? We have 20 gems that are 100 gold pieces. So let's say there's 10 statues. So yellow mold's going to cover 10 statues. Place of all statues, right? Statues, each with two 100 gold pieces. gems or eyes okay so that's we got rid of that right there that's easy um in the the temple itself the temple itself is where we're going to put the rest of the gems right because if we look at the temple let's take a quick look at the map 
So the temple is going to have some statues. The temple is going to have some pillars. Um, we can basically um, set this up so that uh, the the actually no 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 this is where we have fun with the with the with the player characters right. We're gonna make the 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 floor or the stairs bleeding up to the the temple where the temple itself is. We're gonna have it littered littered with jewelry. So let's go back to this because we got to use all that jewelry, right? No better place than to put it in plain sight. Um, there's 21 pieces. I'm just going to quick, quick, quick look, but let's say half of it there. 10 pieces. Okay. So 10 pieces of jewelry are going to be right there, right on the open. Um, any movement in this room will bring forth the, oops. Snake God in 1d4 rounds. Okay. This gets us our, the big snake's going to come if they come into that room. Okay, the rest of the jewelry is going to be in the, so the, the Lair of the Snake God is basically, if we take this again, the Lair of the Snake God is basically, it might be hard to see here, so. This area here, I'm thinking is water. So another thing I want to do here is that there's going to be like an underground underground sea here. So that could be again future adventures. So I'm actually going to say that the rest of this stuff's going to be in the water. So they're going to have to go into this dark water, which you know maybe we'll add some more uh, stuff there if we. Uh, okay. Bank of the underground sea holds eggs and okay that's what we're going to do let's go back to the snake i remember we just put one there but let's look at our snake um our giant snake as it would be and let's see how many are generally appearing so rock parthons um Number appearing is one to three. So I think I'm going to say, um, with, see, uh, holds eggs and one to three rock pythons. And see, um, jewelry at the bottom of the C if the water is entered roll 1d6 per round per water is entered one piece can be one piece per character can be recovered per turn. Roll wandering monster each turn on success. We're going to have a sea snake. Uh, Wow, one to eight sea snakes. One to eight sea snakes. Okay, so it is me. You know, I'm bumping up this extra treasure. I know that, but again, these guys don't usually have any treasure, so it's not like if they were in there, I could have rolled zero for the treasure. So it's not like I'm. Okay, so we've got that. The high priest is going to have the ten five hundred gold. Uh, okay. 
So I think we're gonna make the high priest a slightly uh, more advanced snake man. A snake man. Bites as three hit dice as max hit points. And can cast as a level three cleric. All right, we'll give him some cleric spells. I mean, a level three cleric is only going to have two first level spells, so it's not like he's going to have much going on there, but it's a little, little extra. Right? Um, okay, so the main entrance is going to be patrolled. Oops. by uh let's see how these guys normally are they're typically found in one to eight oh. i'm not going to do one day because i feel like that's too much so i'm just going to pick the average which would be i guess four and a half so i'm going to say four four snake men Times. Okay. Uh, oh, the thing we don't have here is the uh, Snake Man Chambers. Roll. So when you're walking through this area, you're going to roll Wandering Monster each turn on success. One to eight Snake Man. Okay, um, so we're going to do that, and then we're going to, so that gives us our base, right? So we have the, we've gotten rid of, got rid of, we got the, oh, actually, I didn't say that he has the, uh, where's, ah, small, hides, 10, Gems in palette. So basically, in, in this bed, right? Um, and now, now what we have, I'm just taking care of the big stuff first. And then we have basically the actual treasure treasure, right? So any of the larders that they search um, will have some of this treasure, right? Um, there's basically, there's 39 of them. I could just divide it up evenly, which would kind of make sense. But I think what I'll do instead is, is I'll just say that um, whenever any any turn they spend searching, they'll find uh, up to a hundred um, of any of the coins, right? And this way, as they're searching around, and then any remaining coins that they that are left over at the end will will drop into the into the sea. Oh, actually, the high priest should have something too. He's going to have well, he has the gems, um, also on person on their person because it could be female person is let's say as we'll, we'll say he's he's you know 500 platinum pieces okay so here we're going to have any turn spent searching reveals hmm, let's do this we'll go Could be up to 100 coins right so i'm going to say uh but i don't want it to be 100 i'm gonna say uh five to 100 because i don't want it to just be nothing five to 100 coins and then one to two is silver three five is gold because i think there's more gold than anything else right is that right Yep. And six will be platinum. I'm just going to do it this way. That way it's even. So it's clear that it's gold pieces, even though I suppose that should be clear no matter what. But let's just do it this way so it's consistent. Okay. 
Um, okay, I'm then I'm going to say if any remaining coins not found in chambers will be C each turn find 100 coins. Up to the max. Okay. So let's take a look at this again. We've got essentially the mine itself. There's going to be any treasure in the actual mine, right? That'll just be a pathway in. They might encounter a green slime or some other random thing, but basically that's just building up the tension. When they get down, they're going to have this main hall, which is going to have some four snake men patrolling, right? So, you know, if they sneak down, if they don't use a light source, if they do whatever, then they probably might not be seen when they stick their head in there. And they'll probably see the snake men that are going to be in the, uh, in the hallway and they can maybe figure out a way to take them out quietly or not. Then they're going to see these passageways off the side where, um, you know, clearly they can explore and uh, find treasure. This is a very, very rich, you know, uh, society. And then once they've kind of uh, got to the temple area, they're just going to see jewelry spread out on the on the, the thing. And again, player characters, well, if they're smart, they'll be cautious. But, you know, they're going to move forward. And as soon as they enter that room, the, the snake god's going to come. Um, and okay so that's it so the snake on itself is tough but it's not the toughest thing in the world so if they kill that um you know it might just be too easy so what i'm going to say is once um combat with snake god brings high priest in 1d4 rounds and then We'll make, it, we'll make it random, so we'll say five to eight snake men every 1d4 rounds until the entire lair is encountered. Right, because it's only 40 total, so I need to make a note of that up here. Total of 39 snake men, one, and one snake man. Uh, high priest. Okay, so. Now let's go through one more time. We've got the mine coming in, like I just said. So they're gonna come into this hallway. And actually, I'll show you the map. <laughs> that would be a better way to show it. Okay, so the characters are going to come uh, you know, down these stairs. And in this area, there's gonna be four snake men on patrol. However, you know, however you wanna do it. I probably have them marching per pro personally, but I don't like to put that much detail into these things. Let people figure out how they wanna do it. I mean, the smart way to do it would be to have to here, you know, to here, and they march to the center and back, 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 right? That way there's always within earshot of each other. Um, so we get four snake men here. They come down, four snake men, you know, depending on what they want to do, they might want to go in here or in here. And at that point, they're at the, the situation where they might encounter snake man. They might not. I mean, they probably will over time. They're going to be digging through their stuff, basically stealing their stuff, right? And you might be saying, well, where the heck are the rest of them when this is going on? I mean, I'm not going to worry too much about that. They'll make their way through here. Um, once they do, once they get to this point and they cross here, they're going to see these gems and jewelry here. The snake cod is going to come out here to fight them. And again, even if even if they got that far without encountering anybody, it's going to bring the priest immediately, and then it's going to bring snake men after snake men after snake men, and they're going to basically get slaughtered if they just walk right in there to get the stuff. So hopefully they're more clever than that, um, and they'll be able to figure something out. Maybe they'll run into here and make a bottleneck. I mean, who knows what they're going to do? But in any case, 
there's a whole lot of treasure going on. And if they come down here to the larder, they can get more treasure, but there's this yellow mold threat. So there is a lot of treasure in here. And a player a group could easily uh, walk out of here with enough to like level everybody up, uh, you know, to the point where the, they're almost a third level, um, even if they've just reached second level, probably past third level, like that third level and then almost enough to fourth, you know, depending on the size of the group. Um, but remember, in BX, you can only level one level per uh, session. So if they do come down here, I mean, <laughs> clever group will come down here, kill a few of these snake men, get, you know, several thousand gold pieces worth of gems and jewelry and then retreat. Now, of course, the snake men are going to refortify and stuff like that in the future. Maybe they might even come out and hunt the PCs. So that's a whole other thing, right? So these things can grow from where they're at. But if we just look at it as a strategic come in, these guys are going to, the player character is going to come in and they are going to basically, if they're stealthy and clever and they can keep the numbers down so they don't get raided upon by, you know, uh, by ton, tons of snake men at once, they might have a chance of taking them out. These troglodyte snake men are two hit dice, so they're not pushovers. The the priest having some spells, clerical spells, is going to help. The snake at the end is going to be pretty tough. And, of course, if they decide to plunge into the water to get all that extra XP later, they're going to now face more snakes. So, again, they might come, get beat up, you know, but be victorious, and then either, like, fortify themselves at the top of the mine or here or whatever, rest, and then go into the water after. This could open up into an underwater sea adventure. There's a lot of things that could happen here. And... I might, before I release release this, uh, you know, publicly, uh, what I'll do, not this video, but this adventure, I'll flesh out the Snake Men Society a little bit now that I've got some ideas in my head. But pretty much when I play it the first time, I'll just kind of do what I think feels right and I'll make notes to myself. And that's usually how I run these kind of things. Real, real simple. Let the players kind of take it where they're going to take it. And we'll see. We'll see where they get. Right. So... Let me know what you guys think. Hopefully that part about rolling up the treasure made sense to the person. I'm sorry, I don't have the email in front of me to, or message in front of me that, that asked about it, but hopefully that was helpful. If there's any other parts of this that, that I'm brushing over too quickly and you want to hear more of, let me know. I plan on kind of inserting these in as we go. I mean, there's 10 different things, so hopefully uh, I've been doing a few, you know, because I've been in an adventure creating mood, but I may then take up a little break from this. i got to go back to the Mega Dungeon anyways. Um, Maybe we'll make an entire level of Mega Dungeon one of these things if it works out that way. So let me know what else you guys want to see on the channel. If you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe, ring the bell, and all the goodness. And I'll see you next time.